There is a man at the back of his ear, <laughs> next to the door, called Gordon Mallet. And I would like you to come and stand next to David Metcalf, if you wouldn't mind. So do I open this now? Normally you tear the tongue. <laughs> I am tearing it apart. Oh, look at this. Oh, my God. Can I give you the feeling? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, uh, wow. Uh, au revoir. I'm going to lose the flux. <laughs> So, yes, this is obviously, oh my God, look at this, I remember that. Oh. Yeah, I, have to, I will have to have a look at this privately because it's going to be too hard. But anyway, I believe there is page at the back uh, that are for people to sign. So uh, I will sort of pass it from here and you can, is, there, is, is anyone going to pay? Pay with the good. And... Uh, be please uh, do not restrain yourself <laughs> in your comment. Whatever you write, imagine that everybody can see you in your pajamas. So you can write whatever you really feel. All right? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Before uh, I start, and I'm going to uh, uh, not thank everyone because it would be far too complicated and probably boring, um, I'm going to also try not to <clears throat> cry, but um, Tony Balder is here and on my personal invitation, he was a um, partner of Vanessa Goodwin. And I would like all of us to reflect for 10 seconds about her because I met her doing not the black dog ride, but the police pedal, which I did five or six years in a row. And she was an extraordinary woman, an extraordinary politician, and I do believe an extraordinary minister. And, uh, well, the crab got the best of her as well. So maybe for 10 seconds or so, we we'll reflect on Vanessa's loss, especially for Tony. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, this uh, this scooter was a was a bit of a an excuse really for me to ride a motorcycle while being a mayor. <laughs> uh, you know, my my uh, my predecessor um, drove a normal Toyota Altizi of some sort, and uh, I was given the key, and I, I couldn't think of anything worse in life than to drive a Toyota Altizi, you know. So I went to it to David, and I said, "Well, you know, I'm not going to drive that." And I said, "No way," um, and because he has no comprehension about any of the passion for road, for uh, as Gordon called it very early in the days, the magic of the black ribbon. I have never forgotten that. Uh, tell and tell he, them what you really want to do. Yeah, well, <laughs> <laughs> it's true that I wanted a big fast Kawasaki at the time, or even maybe an Ali, but uh, I was I was denied that. But just just the same, uh, I had. Uh, uh, as people said, you know, I've been to many meetings, but I'll be, I'll be honest, uh, part of the 
joy going to those meetings was to go there and to come back and enjoy a ride. And uh, uh, so I was very lucky because uh, uh, Sergeant Constabulary of the, of the time uh, was... Uh, one day he said to me that his staff had... Uh, a neck injuries because they were sick of looking the other way, so, which was which was very nice. Uh, but I mean, you know, I never went over a certain threshold of speed. <laughs> and like my friend over there, Andrew Quinn, uh, who I would like to very briefly uh, thank because he maintains a scooter for all those years uh, extremely well. Um, I bought from him numerous tires because the tires on a scooter in urban environment is supposed to last 20,000 kilometers, and I'd be lucky to get 4,000 <laughs> out of the way I rode it around here. So and Ando has been, uh, and he uh, cleaned the scooter and prepared it for this exhibition and for perpetuity, I suppose. Um, and uh, perhaps every now and then the scooter might go back to you, either in your museum as uh, Andrew as a motorcycle museum in Bichano and maybe to keep the thing so it, it works even in 50 years from, oh, mind you, you'd be dead. But, <laughs> but whoever, whoever. Uh, so I hope this could, uh, because that was the whole idea. I don't think I will be able to ride anymore. Uh, at least my doctor doesn't think so and I am advised not to ride because if I do crash, uh, what is no, a normal uh, gravel rash for uh, LC person would become a, a death trap for me. So I thought, well, <clears throat> if I am not to use the, the scooter anymore, I <clears throat> considering its history uh, and its rarity, uh, it will be really a, a very uh, a very good asset to, to the museum. I remember the idea came when, uh, when Maureen did an exhibition about the old doctor in the 1880. And I saw all those instruments that he was using, in particular for enema. And, uh, <laughs> and I thought, my God, am I really glad to live in the 20th, 21st century? So, but the fact is, those are artifacts, those are part of the, the history of Glamorgan Spring Bear of the East Coast. And I, I thought, I was so impressed with that, with that exhibition, with, you know, the normal local doctor tools. Oh, I was almost wishing I was a sheep. <laughs> now, there is one little item I would like to uh, um, uh, straighten as we are here. It's a mayoral robe. I have been criticized by uh, some uh, obviously uninformed people and councillors that uh, I extravagantly spend thousands of dollars to have this robe made. Now, that is a myth, it is a lie, it is perfidious comment by people who uh, want to be perfidious. Um, and the robe, David and I went to a, a fabric shop in Hobart, and we bought the fabric, and it was taken to Ellen Minos in, uh, in Bichano. There are some Bichano people who would know Ellen Minos, she's a local stitcher. And she made this robe uh, with the fabric that we bought. And the total budget for that robe was $250, including labor. <laughs> so uh, it was not, in my opinion, that extravagant. Uh, the riding equipment that is with a scooter is unique uh, on, on many respects. I have given all the documentation to Maureen and Marie. Uh, who is helping her uh, extraordinarily well. So, again, all this will be recorded, will be um, part of, of the, like the enema machine of the doctor, <laughs> uh, part of the inheritance of, um, of, um, of the region. Uh, I would like to briefly acknowledge the gentleman that is right next to you, Senator, that behind you there, as, as you, you both share uh, uh, the same country of Perth. And um, Peter Terming is uh, one of the most well-known uh, and longest-serving uh, motorcycle journalist, uh, travel writer, publisher, and writer of many books. And I convinced him to come all the way down here. Uh, and with a bit of luck, he's going to 
publish about this uh, gathering to his own magazine that he published and own, but also to several other magazines, um, uh, including in Germany. And uh, I cross my finger, but he hopes to be able to sell that story uh, as a scooter is a Honda uh, <laughs> to, uh, to Honda uh, World, that it, so it would, might be published into the Honda World magazine, which is distributed, I believe, in several languages uh, to every single car and motorcycle dealer, Honda car and motorcycle dealer in the world. Mm. Now, he's not sure that he's going to pull it, but we, we, we hope so. Now, that will basically put this region on the map, even, as Ruth said, you know, uh, uh, every Honda dealer in the world. I mean, you know, it's very hard to get better than that. Yeah. <coughs> so, thank you. His nickname is the Bear. <laughs> in French, Lours. Um, so, thank you, Bear. Right. Um, I will go to now, to, to a brief chronological history of uh, my, um, my move uh, to Queensland because I have been made aware that there is a lot of uh, pop talk, some kind of lots of bullshit, I suppose, <laughs> you know, um, about why and how and da 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 da. So I'm going to tell you the truth. So it will be <clears throat> at least from the horse's mouth, even if he sounds like a frog. <laughs> um, uh, and, uh, and so, it, you know, if anyone uh, starts to keep on the bullshit, you can say, well, not quite true. It all started um, where, when my daughter, who uh, was told she could never have a baby, for some reason had a baby <laughs> at age 38, uh, which was definitely not expected. Uh, so she started to put pressure on me to be a grandfather. Uh, I never planned to be a grandfather. Uh, I have a daughter that could not have any baby, and I have a gay son. So <laughs> <laughs> my grandfather uh, hope were pretty sort of tiny, and so out of miracle, I suppose, perhaps a divine intervention. I'm not sure. Anyway, so she gave birth to this little boy who is uh, very healthy, but all of a sudden I was re requ required, blackmail, literally, to, to, uh, and she's up there, and I am down here. <coughs> and she said, you know, so I, I started to come very regularly to visit her. On top of that, probably because I'm, I, I'm no doctor, but she uh, was uh, affected with uh, postnatal depression, maybe because she had this baby so late, I'm not sure. And um, as I uh, have always tried to support people uh, with depression, no matter what depression, this was my own daughter. So, so I started to travel quite often to visit her and uh, live at her house. And this was not good to them to the baby and to me. <laughs> baby do cry a lot, you know, and they do in the nappies and all, and all that stuff. And so I was not quite prepared for that. So I decided, okay, if I'm to keep doing this on a regular basis, I better buy myself a house, a kind of a secondary holiday type house where I can come visit my daughter, but hey, have a little you know, room to myself. So that's what I did. And uh, then uh, I kept on commuting and I started to feel really bad, really. Not bad, actually. I've never been in pain. That's a funny part. But, you know, like <laughs> a big French fat slug, you know, <laughs> a big escargot. <laughs> And so I went to David and I said, listen, man, I'm, 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 I'm not right, you know. And so I, I was fully living here uh, in Bichonneau, driving license here, voting here, et cetera, et cetera. And I went to see uh, Dr. Romenka and I, he's, I know he's not here, but I would like to publicly uh, thank him. And he, uh, we, he discovered that I had a, a blood uh, disorder called myelodysplasia. 
which is not fatal, despite the fact that my mother died of it, but you know, it was sort of okay. And uh, then one day he rang me and he said, listen, your, your blood count is on free fall, you've got to go to Launceston and da da da. So went to Launceston, met uh, Dr. Bimish, the, the hematologist of uh, and uh, he confirmed, we did a biopsy and blah, blah, blah. So the big news, you've got the crab. Um, so I thank both Dr. Van Tempest before he died and, and Dr. Romenka have been absolutely <clears throat> terrific. Then uh, I, Dr. Bimish said, I cannot keep you your dossier here. You need, I need to send this to the Sunshine Coast uh, Hospitality uh, um, University Hospital. And so we did, and uh, I met there a new uh, hematologist who confirmed that my myelodysplasia had turned into a full-blown acute leukemia. Um, so he said to me, basically, <clears throat> you cannot... Uh, you cannot commute like this. Mm. You're going to die. Mm. And, and we can't treat you halfway in one state and halfway in the other. It's just not going to work. So uh, I said to him, well, wh what's my hope? And he said, it will take six months of very heavy chemo to, uh, to know if I can save your life. And uh, so I went to David and, I said, well, and he said, okay, well, we'll apply for six months. Uh, medical leave, so to see if this treatment will work or not, so I could possibly finish my term, which finished in October this year. Um, now, my leave was denied uh, by um, three councillors that uh, will remain anonymous at least here by walking out of the room, so the vote could not proceed. I have no particular gripe against that, but it is why I had no choice but to resign. Because uh, my medical leave was not granted and my treatment had to be done in Queensland. So I was stuck between a, a rock and, and a hard place and, and I had to resign earlier than I wanted to. Uh, Councillor Fama has been fished out, he's here somewhere with a funny hat on his head. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I had him as a councillor for a number of years, so that was a really good outcome, because at least I knew that uh, uh, whoever took my seat uh, wouldn't be... Uh, I won't say what I think. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that, that is what happened. And now I am, uh, you see me reasonably well now because I'm in between chemo. I have asked my doctor to give me uh, three weeks off of the normal pattern. And uh, because otherwise I, I, I couldn't stand here. It's just that simple. Right, so this is as far as the story of why and how all this led to my resignation as a councillor. Now, I have asked... Gordon to be here because <clears throat> so I, I dealt in all my uh, local government uh, years with only two general managers and he's one of them. The first two years. He's a style though. <laughs> <laughs> and I had no idea. I had no idea how things worked. You know, uh, uh, this is why uh, I don't know if the mayor, is the mayor still here? Or is he not? Yeah. Mayor Kent, are you still here? Yes. Yeah. Well, Mayor Kent, I suppose I've, I've learned by himself, you know, it's really difficult uh, to be a mayor if you have not been in council before. I think it's almost impossible. So I did my two years with Gordon. And the reason why I, I, I found that he was living in Tasmania after going back to Victoria, and I'm, I'm very fond of him, and uh, he, he did an excellent taste in wine in particular. Um, <laughs> And so I asked him to come because he, he taught me many things. And if it was not for him, I would never have run for mayor. It, it is him. Mm -hmm. I was going to resign after two years. I thought this was a bit of a joke, this council, and things were done in a way that I left me completely flabbergasted. <laughs> and uh, and he's, the one, he's the one who said to me, well, mate, the only way you will have any kind of influence and any kind of bringing a sort of 
a change, not so much a change for the better, but just a, a lift up of the act. He's run for me. And I said, come on, you know, like I ride motorbike, I've got facial hair, I'm a walk, like, you know, like. That's why I said it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this will never work. So uh, just the same, I, I went along and, um, and then he resigned, and, uh, which will bring me to the next part of my speech, but he resigned uh, for, for all sorts of uh, wrong reason. Um, and, um, and so I ran for mayor, and the rest is history. I got elected, and da da da. And he was right. It, it's, uh, it takes to be the mayor to really have the connection. At, it's not so much in council, but to know people like Senator Abetz or David Llewellyn or, you know, people who have, are in the higher sphere of power, and as you will be, or are already. But um, da da da. So. Um, it, it, that's why I wanted him to be here today, you know, because he's the one with whom I achieved everything, but he's the one who triggered uh, this, uh, yeah, so... Well, what else were you going to do? Ben? Oh, well, I don't know. <laughs> let's, not, let's not go there. I probably would have ended up with, with a bad woman. Um, so, now, Gordon told me uh, about emotional refugee, and I brushed on this before, but he also... Uh, taught me and David even more uh, over the years that uh, an elected person, I suppose at every level, maybe the senator will corroborate this, um, you can't be efficient as an elected person if you don't work hand in hand within reason, don't have to kiss anyone's bottom, <laughs> right? but within reason with the administration. The administration is what makes a ship working. And sure, you can be on the deck upstairs and say, okay, we're going to go to Cape 320. But if no one works downstairs to make the ship go, you don't get anywhere. Now, those two guys taught me that. And that's what I tried to do during all the uh, 12 years in, in local politics, to trust to a degree, because religion is never perfect, but to trust the staff from the general manager all the way to the guy with the fluid jacket that sweeps the street. And here we have got the works manager uh, who is filming me, uh, innocently <laughs> like this. And, uh, and uh, yeah, and Tony and I, you know, through, through, through the general manager. And so I just wanted to, to brush on this, and there is another general manager over there, and you know, and another one over there from Brighton. And, and they are, I suppose they are all here because I have been this kind of elected guy that think, and I still think today as hard as ever, that if, if you are elected and you treat the administration like a bunch of twits, incapable moron, and I will avoid the B word, uh, you will never get anywhere. And so I just uh, uh, wanted you to, to understand that. The next point is um, this job is probably the best job I ever did. Um, I worked for the ABC for a number of years. The ABC is worse than the bloody world of politics. It's terrible. <laughs> the clan and all the cra oh god you know I mean I, I was lucky to be relatively independent in what I did but uh, the world of politics is actually quite good compared to the internal world of the ABC um, but what this job did uh, for me uh, the second best job was in the ABC but the first job now that I am 17 next week um, is what I did here because at the end of the day, you get so close to, there is a lot of people here, uh, like the president of the Bichonneau RSL, and you know, people from Bichonneau and from Coles Bay, and I, I won't go dwell on, but with whom I had some extraordinarily uh, um, personal contact. And people from all sorts of way of life, like, you know, uh, I met in Bichonneau people that live on Rosedale Road, like I never even knew people lived like that. <laughs> I met the big hog pig, you know, and it was like a complete mystery to me, all that. Uh, all the way uh, to people um, 
with uh, uh, lots of money and very cultured and and the the, the range of people you you meet uh, in in a job like this one in a rural municipality is just extraordinary. So for me, you know, I I was riding my scooter, going to and from meetings, singing, singing right. you know, singing. I mean, there is meeting where, which I would have rather not dealt with, but. Overall, overall over 12 years, you know, it has been really extraordinary to, uh, uh, I suppose that's how, it, despite my accent and, and the fact that I like to remain French, uh, uh, it made me become a real Aussie. Uh, uh, and I, I can speak strong just as good as anyone else, mate, you know. Um, um, do I miss Tasmania? Yes, big fat letter, yes, I miss Tasmania. Do I miss the East Coast? Yes, big fat letter. I miss the East Coast. Do I miss the Do I miss the Council? Yes, smaller letter, but <laughs> I miss, uh, the, the Council. Do I enjoy Queensland? No, <laughs> within reason though, because um, I have a very nice house, which, as I said, I bought for a sort of a holiday for family together. So it's not a sort of it's almost a. Uh, like a shack in Coles Bay or somewhere, and uh, but I can't stand the damn climate. Mm -hmm. Oh, I miss the fresh air of here. Mm -hmm. I miss, and there is so many damn people. <laughs> <laughs> you just can't move. No matter where you go, you are in someone's way. <laughs> when you live here, you you go somewhere, you are in no one's way. And you don't realize how. Lucky we are here, especially the local, and in Tasmania in general, to have all this room, all the ah, oh, you know. So this being said, the people of Queensland are people, that, which means, you know, there is a range starting with the letter B1 all the way to, you know, to uh, like like everywhere else. But generally speaking, I've joined uh, the local. Uh, village association of my village and I go to the meeting and I feel I'm in Bichonneau or in, <laughs> <laughs> in Swansea with all the same beach and all the same thing. And the poor old councillor is there saying, oh yeah, I will do that. And I sit there and say, yeah, yeah, right. So <laughs> there is not much change. Don't go to Queensland to feel that you have, you know, changed different world. No, no, no. It, it will be more or less the same. And I'm almost sure that if I would move to a French village and look, join the local French village association, it would be the same thing uh, again as well. Right. So that uh, my talk about Tasmania and Queensland. Um, I hope uh, I am fighting as best as I can. Uh, I hope to live long enough um, to be able to come back here uh, and and to uh, bring my carer, uh, Josefina, who is here, who is looking after me extraordinarily well uh, and putting up with my antiques more so than with my uh, sickness, so, um, which is great patience. Um, uh, and uh, uh, to, to, to finish, I... Uh, We'll uh, talk very briefly because it's not a very nice uh, um, subject. Uh, I uh, I had uh, I had people uh, visiting me from New Caledonia as I established a lot of contact there, and uh, they all want to visit me before I die, and this is killing me. <laughs> but what do you do? You know, you can't sort of say, "Well, peace off," you know. <laughs> Let me die in my corner, and, you know, like oh. so. Um, and uh, and they, you know, I mean, those are people who saw me on television and, and came here. Many of them visited uh, Tasmania and the East Coast, and they would never in a million years have done that. Um, and so, I had a group of five of them at my house, and and one of the lady uh, in her early forties said to me, you know, aren't you scared? And I said, what do you mean? She said, aren't you scared? You, you're going to die. I mean, you know, and I said, no. I am not scared of this. And she said, That's, everybody is scared of this. And I said, no, because you see, I have been lucky enough 
in my life, 70 years of it, to almost never do what I did not want to do. To almost, for the 70 years I've lived, always blossomed into activities that I enjoyed. So my life uh, could not have been better, despite the, you know, the bump and the fall and the drama. At the end of the day, my life could not have been better. So why should I be scared of dying? Because the ones that are scared of dying are the ones who think they had a shit life. <laughs> you know, all the other they did some things they didn't like or didn't want to do and didn't get the right woman or the right this or the right job. And so, of course, they cling there, hoping that one day it's going to get better. Well, I don't need that. I had the best ever. And so, mentally and psychologically, I'm serene. Uh, I know I'm going to fight as best as I can. I have a plan to last until at least January 2019 uh, because there is a 40th uh, anniversary of the Mad Max shoot. <laughs> and um, we have a big gathering, 15 to 20,000 people in Clunes. And I'm going to drive my Trans Am all the way from the Sunshine Coast to Clunes. Oh. After that, I don't know, maybe I'll... <laughs> <laughs> and that's all I have to say. I would like to thank you all for coming. I'm, we tried to make a list of all the people I, I had to thank. It was so long, we would still be there in two hours. So um, we're going to skip on that. But those who need to be thanked uh, know that I am thanking them, including all you guys who came here. Uh, I won't start in names because I'll never get out of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, a lot of people have talked about Bertrand's contribution to this area and to Tasmania in general and indeed to Australia, but he made a great contribution to motorcycling in this country as well, and I'd like to thank him on behalf of the motorcyclists of Australia, those who used his fairings on their motorcycles, those who had his encouragement uh, to ride and to keep riding. Bertrand also supplied a, a great deal of humour to, uh, uh, to the field, including his brown <coughs> racing leathers, which were probably the funniest bit of racing uh, gear that anyone has ever worn on a racetrack in Australia, and which unbelievably someone at some stage actually stole. Oh. Um, this is a sad occasion in many ways, but there are bright sides, and one of them is that the roads of Tasmania and the rest of Australia will be considerably safer <laughs> off, the, uh, off the air. We rode to Sydney once together from Melbourne to the motorcycle show and uh, uh, I was on a, a turbocharged uh, motorcycle and he was on a 650 uh, Suzuki which had trouble keeping up and we stopped on top of one of the, the dams in the, uh, uh, in the snowy mountains and when he arrived the, uh, the, the brake pads of his motorcycle were glowing red and he was leaving a trail of smoke coming down the hill. So Bertrand's been a, a, a large presence in, in many ways and a positive presence, I think, always. But um, as he took the trouble to uh, uh, disabuse you of some of the, the false, false news, as, as, the, as we say these days, um, I have one point to make too, and that is... I've known him for nearly 40 years, and I'm here to tell you that the more he drinks, the weaker his French accent gets. <laughs> thank you. I'd just like to thank all the speakers today for sharing your memories and uh, thoughts with Bertrand. 
I'd particularly like to thank Maureen Martin Ferris for so ably organising today and managing the guest list. You, your staff and volunteers have done an amazing job and we do appreciate it. <laughs> Bertrand, you and I share a love for local government, and I'm probably going to be like David McCuff here. <laughs> we did disagree from time to time, but we always had a healthy respect for each other's views and skills. I will treasure my memories of our time on Glamorgan Spring Bay Council together. We often competed for the title of brightest jacket, in, and <laughs> as the senator said, sometimes shoes um, in the chamber. But I'm going to miss Ooh la la, Madam Deputy Mayor, <laughs> and classy dress, Madam Deputy Mayor. <laughs> so, from your friends in attendance here, Bertrand, the wider Glamorgan Spring Bay community, the Tasmanian community, au revoir, Bertrand, our love and good wishes go with you. <laughs> so, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of Bertrand, Thank you for your attendance today. I know he appreciates your support and your kind words. Please stay, enjoy lunch, share your memories with Bertrand and please write your memories in his book. Thank you. Thank you.